Hello everyone, XCT here. Today we are going to solve Lock, an easy Windows machine that was recently added to VanLab. We will use an access token to access Gitty, get access to the machine by pushing a web shell, and then escalate privileges by decrypting a mremote and gconfig and exploiting a pretty recent PDF24 vulnerability. Alright, so I already did a port scan here, there's port 80 and port 3000, and also some default Windows ports here, there's SMB and RDP. Um, let's check out the website first. We go here, we see a static HTML page with some information about the company. So you get some references to PDFs here and you get some usernames here in the real. All right, not too much. Um, Pod 3000, you can find Gitty. So that's a bit more interesting. First thing I, I want to check if we go to Gitty instance, it's always like explore, same on GitLab or anything like that to see if there are public repositories. And there's indeed one here. So let's go to the repository and check this um, Python script here. Um, let's see what this is actually doing. Um, it's getting an access token from the environment and then it's doing um, get repositories, which is basically listing all repositories that this user has access to. All right, so one other thing you can always do in this case is, is check the history to see if something changed. Maybe an older version has, has other stuff in it, right? And if you go to the initial commit here, you can see that there was once a hard-coded personal access token. So that's pretty interesting. Here he wasn't taking it from the environment, but just hard-coded it. So maybe it's still valid, right? Let's take it here. And then if you remember this request he did here, and just try to do the same thing he did with the authorization header and the token here using curl. We just do it like that. That's exactly the request he did as well. And we get a pretty large response here. Let's see. Um, okay, here you can see one of the repositories, um, which is called a website. That's interesting because that one we didn't see, so that's not a public repository. In addition to the one we already found, there's at least one more um, that's private. Okay, and with the access token, we can basically access this repository. So let's try to clone it somehow. So when you look a bit around on what you can do with the access token, and if you can use it on the CLI, you will find that for example, in the Stack Overflow post, he's describing um, once you have a token, you can enter it instead of your password. So this essentially seems to work just like the normal password of the user, which is like really convenient. So let's just go here and then we do a git clone and it will ask us like for the username. So we give it and then we just put this token here. And if the post is right, we should be able to clone it. Yeah, that works. So that's a really convenient way to use the access token. All right, let's go to the website repository, see what's in here. Um, first of all, let's go for README here. Um, new project website, CICD integration is now active. Changes to this repository will automatically be deployed to the web server. So that's pretty interesting. This seems to be um, the, the website we had here, right? Um, I mean, we can like cut this and maybe grab for a powerful you can see it's the same website. So the, the way this is set up is that um, this is the user that's maintaining the website and every time he commits to this repository, it will automatically be deployed to the web server, which is like really convenient and also what's done in the real world usually if you have like a website that needs maintaining. Okay, well, what can we do? Um, this is a Windows machine, right? Chances are this is an IIS web server. Let's just refresh this here. Maybe just take one of the old requests and if we go here, yeah, we can see this is IIS. So chances are we can upload an ASPX shell here. So let's actually try to do that. All right, so I'm creating a really simple ASPX shell here. Um, I think that's one of the default shells that's on Kali or if you like just Google for ASPX shell, that's probably one of them you're going to find. I don't exactly remember where I got it from, but it's a really simple web shell. Um, and I stored that now here in the website repository. So we can git add the file, because if you do git status, you can see it's not added yet, so you have to add it. Now it's here as a new file, we got a commit. As always, great commit comments, and then we do a git push, and it should ask us, yes, again, for username and password. Um, you know, that was the token here. And this should allow us to push there. And if the README markdown file wasn't lying, this shell should actually be now on the web server.
Okay, so here's our web shell. So this worked and we can just click run here and see the output from the net users command. Um, let's see if you have any like special permissions here. Um, okay, we are not really in any special groups. Um, some IIS groups here because, well, this is a web app and it's running as this particular user, which is Doc Alan Freeman. This was the same user we had on Git, right? And privileged wise, we also don't really have anything particularly interesting. So let's actually get a shell first, a proper shell, not just a web shell. So um, as a program, I'm going to execute PowerShell here and then just going to put. Um, reverse shell one line, I hear the typical thing we always use. And then I open a listener. And I think this should give us a shell. Yes, this looks pretty good. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Let's go to C here. Um, all right, and let's now explore the machine a bit and see if anything interesting is going on. Um, we can also use ls here because we are in PowerShell and also ls-fo and this will show hidden folders as well. So there's an install folder here. We already saw that on another machine. So that seems to be common. Um, in install, we have a couple of files here. There's Firefox, mRemoteNG and PDF24 Creator. So these applications are probably installed here. Besides that, maybe we can check out program files to see if anything interesting is installed here. There's Git, there's PDF24. Um, Firefox, so these installer files were not just for show, and in the other program files directory we can see mRemoteNG. So all three applications we saw are actually installed. Um, let's actually check users here. Okay, we are Ellen Freeman. There's one other user, which is Gail Decarios, and there's the administrator user. So let's go to our folder again here, and then see if we got anything interesting, like on the desktop, um, okay, nothing here, also no flag, so that one comes a bit later. Then downloads, always good to check. Um, documents as well. And documents has a config file, so let's go there and actually read this file to see what's going on here. Let's see. Um, mRemoteNG, so we saw the software is installed and this seems to be the config file that is used. So let's actually just copy paste this file over Let's put it here and do config.xml, paste this here. All right, then maybe we just open it here so I can show it a bit better. And maybe we do a word wrap. All right, mRemoteNG is a software that you can use, um, I believe, to connect to, to various endpoints. And you can store the passwords that you use for those connections inside of a config file. And this is something I saw in real engagements as well. So the software is actually used and this is a thing. Um, one credential that is saved here is RDP Gale. Um, it's like just a name you can give it, right? Um, okay, so let's see, username is Gale Decarios. That was the user on the machine we saw and there's a password here. But um, this password is encrypted. So maybe we can find a way to decrypt it and then use his Critex credential to connect via RDP ourselves, right? That would be great. Um, it even tells us a bit how this is encrypted here in the header. We see it's AES with uh, GCM mode and the number of iterations and so on. So this should be decryptable as long as the key is something that's like hard coded in the application and always the same, right? In fact, this is exactly what's going on here. Um, there are some different repositories you can find on GitHub that basically allow you to decrypt this. And if we go to the script here, here you can actually see it. Um, you give it just a config file and then there's a password parameter. But if you don't give anything, um, it has a default, which is um, MR3M. And this is the default password that the software uses to encrypt all passwords if you don't change it. So this is also the case here. So let's grab the script here. It's going to double get it here quickly. And then we run it, we give it the config file and it should be it. And yeah, we decrypted the password. This only worked because it was encrypted with a hard-coded key, which is obviously not the best idea. So now that we have the password, let's try to RDP to the machine. And we can just use X3 RDP here. And yep, the password was correct. We can connect via RDP. And we can also see that the user flag is on the desktop of this user. All right, let's go for the privisc. Um, usually you could like run a privisc script or look around a bit. 
Um, but in this case, we're going straight for PDF24 because we see it already on desktop and it kind of looks suspicious, right? Um, and if you look for vulnerabilities for the software, there's this great post here by Seconsult, which is um, describing a vulnerability in version 11.15.1 or lower. And we know from the install directory that we actually have exactly this version. So we should be good and this should be vulnerable. Okay, so it seems the MSI was producing a visible CMD EXE window running a system when using the repair function of MSI exec. Okay, this is interesting. Um, a local attacker can use a chain of actions to open a fully functional CMD.exe with the privileges of the system user. This looks pretty good. System is something we want. So let's see how we can exploit this. Um, okay, it has to be installed with an MSI file. Well, we already saw the installer file, so this is probably the way it is here. And it's telling us to run this um, MSI exec dash FA, um, then the path to the MSI, and this is basically triggering the repair function. So it's trying to repair the installation, okay. Um, and some sub process with system privileges wants to write a file in program files. We don't really have any control over that permission wise, right? Because it's in program files and we can't like write there. Um, but since this thing is running with system privileges, it can. But what we can do is we can basically set an op lock on the file, even though we don't have write permissions or anything on it. Um, there's a tool here, set op lock.exe from James Forshaw in the symbolic thing testing tools. And we can just um, run it on the file and it basically locked the file when it's read. And because this opened the window on the desktop and it can't read or write the file because we locked it, it's basically waiting there for this lock to go away. And this is not really the case because, well, we, we manually set one and we are not releasing it. So the system window is basically stuck on our desktop and then we can do a series of actions here to make this window spawn a, a new CMD window for us where we can execute commands. So that's the, the basic idea here. It's going to get a bit clearer when we actually do it. So we are now here on the desktop. Let's go to CMD. And first of all to C. Also going to make that a bit bigger. All right. We go to the install folder. We saw the MSI here. Okay. Um, then we need another CMD where we can start the op lock. So how do you get this tool? Well, you can just download it from Symbolic Link uh, testing tools, or in this case, I wrote my own. Just because when I originally exploited this in an engagement, um, the system was running CrowdStrike and the normal one was detected. So I wrote my own one, but you can, in this case, because no AV is running, just use the, the one from the public repository. So I'm just using RDP and copy paste to move this file in here. Then I can go here. And then from the post, we know already the exact command to lock the file, um, which is in this case, ilock.exe because I called it that. Then the full path to this lock file and then the R and now this file gets locked when it's being read. All right. So the only other thing we really have to do at this point is to start the repair action. So let's do that as well in this window, um, just like it showed us in the post. And now the repair is running. Um, this can take quite a bit of time. Um, but if everything worked, at the moment it's trying to read the file, because we locked it, it will get stuck. Alright, so now the thing we were expecting has happened. We have this window here, we can't see it, but it's actually running a system, and it's stuck because it can't operate on the file. So let's just go through the instructions in the post. Well, first right click, then properties, then click legacy console mode here. And then we have to open a browser, so that's the Firefox here. And it's telling in a post that um, Internet Explorer and Edge don't work on Windows 11, but I didn't try it. Um, it's server 2022 here, so it's not Windows 11, but figured I just use Firefox. Okay, um, then we do Control O and get this open file dialog. And now we can type CMD here. And let's see, we are system. So this exploit works. Um, I think it's a pretty cool one and kudos to Seconsult for finding it. That's basically it here. We can just go to users administrator, desktop and grab the final flag here. So that's it for the machine. If you want to try it out, you can join the lab at vanlab.com and get access to this one and many other machines. So thank you for watching and see you next time.